Hello and uh, welcome to this month's EMBL ABR's webinar, which will be about teaching and training and lessons from education and cognitive science to promote learning. My name is Jeff Christensen and I'm from EMBL Australia Bioinformatics Resource, or EMBL ABR for short, and I'll be your host for today. And behind, behind uh, my colleagues, Susanna Sabine from ARDC and Christina Hall from EMBL ABR are behind the scenes co-hosting this webinar with me. EMBL ABR is a distributed national uh, research infrastructure network providing bioinformatics support to life science researchers in Australia. It was set up as a collaboration with the European Bioinformatics Institute or EBI uh, to maximise Australia's bioinformatics capability. We currently have 13 nodes across Australia, each of which undertake or support bioinformatics research around several key areas. And these are data, tools, compute, training, standards, and platforms. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to mention a couple of housekeeping things. So all attendees will be, uh, all attendee microphones are muted during the presentation, and this is just to minimize background noise. If you do have a question, you can type it into the question box in the GoToWebinar software, uh, which is found in the, in the panel. Um, we'll look at the questions at the end of the presentation during that, and I'll relay these to Rochelle. Um, the broadcast will be recorded, and it will be made available on the EMBL ABI YouTube channel. Um, and there's a, a URL here to the YouTube channel, and we'll notify all attendees by email when, they, when these are available. So today we're very, um, we're delighted to have Rochelle Trachtenberg, who is a member of EMBL ABR's International Science Advisory Group delivering our webinar. Rochelle's a tenured professor in the Department of Neurology at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And she has secondary appointments in the departments of biostatistics, bioinformatics and biomathematics, as well as rehabilitation medicine. She is an accredited professional statistician with over 20 years of experience designing and analyzing experimental research and a research methodologist who specialises in designs and analyses with difficult to measure outcomes in um, both biomedical and clinical domains. Additionally, with PhDs in psychology, cognitive sciences and measurement statistics and evaluation, she focuses on curriculum development and evaluation in higher education, training new scientists for ethical practice and statistical literacy for effective stewardship of the discipline in PhD students in particular. She was elected a Fellow of the American Statistical Association in 2016 and a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2017. So today's uh, topic, uh, so in this webinar we have uh, over 80 people registered um, and Rochelle will explore a topic that's of central importance not only to the EMBL ABR nodes um, but also many others across, across Australia and the world and that is how can we help biologists learn and develop skills required to start to understand and then confidently apply computational analyses techniques into their research? Um, results published last year in PNAS in this paper by Feldin et al. of the outcomes of boot camps um, type training in data science that was aimed at PhD students in the US showed that short, sharp training experiences did not in fact lead to any discernible differences between students who did and those who did not attend such workshops. Um, given what's known about adult learners, cognition and common design characteristics of both short, sharp and longer instructional opportunities, this webinar will discuss these results as not surprising. Um, to overcome the difficulties identified by Feldin, um, Rochelle will examine lessons from education, from cognitive science, and from the data and software carpentries, and point to how these lessons can be applied to any adult learning experience, whether that be a boot camp, a course, a program, or curriculum. Okay, so now I will change the presenter to Rochelle, who will start. Um, okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Jeff, and thank you, Australia, for inviting me to um, your time zone for <laughs> a much more efficient sharing of this information from educational and cognitive sciences, specifically to promote learning. Um, so this um, uh, slide, sorry, 
I don't know. Are you still seeing my um, slides? Okay. Uh, so this shows um, just the results basically um, that Jeff alluded to. This PNAS paper from 2017 found that uh, after exploring these boot camp experiences that were federally funded um, as specifically needed for new life science uh, investigators, so pre-doctoral, doctoral, and postdoctoral students, um, these did not have the desired effects on these scholars. Now, my point, as Jeff pointed out, is that uh, most cognitive psychologists were familiar with, um, uh, these are long established findings, would have been able to tell you that this would happen when short, sharp training was applied. Um, but one of the things that isn't necessarily contingent on cognitive psychological findings, but is actually simply an alignment challenge, is what is desired as the outcome of these training experiences and what was assessed as the desired effects. So the desired effects of short and sharp training that anyone delivers, and it's also the uh, desired effect of long form training as well, is that students retain the material long term and that they build on that training. Simply memorizing what is presented to you and never being able to grow that skill set or deepen that um, appreciation for the knowledge or grow the knowledge uh, further, that's not desirable. Um, specifically, integrating this new information into the repertoire of scientific behaviors that you're either learning or beginning to practice more automatically, that's obviously desirable. And Another possible desirable outcome of training in general and education is that the people who engage in these training opportunities learn to or begin to see themselves as and begin to act like members of the community. Um, mem being a member of the scientific community has very concrete requirements, including um, uh, you need to review papers that come into literature, you need to publish in the literature, those are scientific requirements, you train new scientists, you teach, those are all concrete aspects of the scientific community that we sort of do develop. They're never really emphasized, we don't have time in short, sharp training, um, and in some long-form training and doctoral programs, we also don't really make it explicit that the scientific sort of behaviors and practices that we are promoting are actually community-based and make us members of this scientific community. But there's a professional community um, as well, people who do this for a living uh, need to comport themselves and sort of uh, learn and grow as a group and support the learning and growth of that group. And these are all desirable outcomes of any kind of education, but um, these were not the assessments that were included in the training that was evaluated by Felden. So their uh, conclusions did not include these three outcomes and that is actually a problem because we developed these short and long form training without a plan in place to determine whether or not there was long-term retention or building on that training, integration of these new, of all the new information into an ongoing uh, repertoire of professional and scientific skills. And we typically do not assess whether or not uh, the people that we train learn to begin to see themselves as members of a community. So the, what the 2017 findings reiterate for cognitive uh, psychologists, Again, any cognitive psychologist would have told you that um, these findings are predictable, but new thinking patterns, changing the way you think about biology or biological sciences to accommodate and in fact leverage or uh, exploit uh, new information, new tools, you need to have spaced instruction over time and practice, and that practice requires feedback. The fact is, that's how humans learn. Um, and short, sharp training cannot accommodate that requirement. But um, short training may initiate a person to go on and then develop or initiate for themselves a program that's more um, appropriate to long-term retention and um, the development of thinking patterns. Um, but another thing that wasn't made explicit in the 2017 paper, but is another feature that a cognitive scientist would have recognized is that there's a, a, a paradox in learning, adult learning in particular, that's sometimes referred to as the 
Kruger-Dunning paradox, less skilled people will think that they are doing well, learning well, or doing really well. More skilled people tend to be more circumspect or reflective. More skilled people tend not to go to sharp, uh, short, sharp, or intense training like boot camps. Um, so when you ask a less skilled person about the impact or potential impact of this short, sharp training, they will exaggerate. They will say, oh, this is, this is gonna help me so much. I am absolutely doing great with this, but they aren't actually reporting their true state effectively. So this is the context, that was the context. So what we're gonna talk about today um, are lessons from education and educational science from 1956 and 1994. The 1956 uh, lessons you may have heard of, Bloom's Taxonomy, but the 1994 lessons, I'm sure you haven't uh, because they come from psychometrics. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, features of cognitive science and cognitive psychology that can be leveraged to strengthen the uh, chances and likelihood that that real learning, sustainable learning, will uh, result from your training, whether it's short or long form. And then, uh, because the most concrete and immediate response to this 2017 article came from the software and data carpentries, um, they actually have articulated two strategies for designing their short, sharp training, meeting the learners where they are, and leveraging the motivation of the adult learner. Um, and so we will look at how those um, two strategies can be learned from as, for example, MBLABR goes forward. So as I mentioned, Bloom's Taxonomy was first published in 1956. This is something that most uh, universities in the United States introduced to graduate students who will be teaching. They're called teaching assistants or TAs. So as you enter your doctoral program, you end up teaching um, the undergraduates. And so at least once during that period of time, you will be introduced to Bloom's Taxonomy. It has, it articulates six levels of cognitive skills moving from less complex to more and extremely complex. So memorization is level one. And if you're assessing at Bloom's level one, you would require, you would ask questions where students are recognizing, not actually uh, generating. If you say, what is the answer to this question? They uh, just have to pick it from a list. So that's, as you will recognize, a multiple choice question format. Level two, slightly more complex, is being able to understand and summarize what uh, happens. So you can fill in the blank. Um, or write a summary of something that is already well-known and well-parameterized. And level three is application or illustration, where you are taught some factual knowledge, and uh, there may be a vignette, and you, you'll be asked, what uh, principle is this vignette uh, an example of? Um, or you may extrapolate from examples that you have seen to actually new examples. Um, one of the key characteristics of Bloom's levels one, two, and three for our purposes is the very, very close and explicit parameterization of the problem and the fact that rules or a, a really straightforward way of answering the question is available to the learner or the person who's responding at one of these three levels. The fourth level, analysis and prediction, is also rule-based. Um, so you know that if you have continuous data, you cannot use a chi-square analysis, that's a rule. Um, and predicting which type of analysis will work. Also, you're using rules. So Bloom's levels one, two, three, and four do increase in complexity. You can see that memorization versus analysis are uh, different in terms of how much thinking, how much sophistication of thinking is required to answer the questions that are structured at those levels. Also, when you are teaching, if you teach a person in a memory driven way rather than an analysis driven way, um, you will be able to ask them different types of questions or you won't be able to ask them specific types of questions. But then we come to levels five and six. When people teach two Bloom's levels one, two, three, and four, the assessment is highly amenable to a multiple choice exam because everything is sort of rule-based and concrete. For creation and synthesis, the answer, if I want to know if you can create, I cannot use a multiple choice exam. You have to write something new for me to determine whether or not you've created something new or if you've synthesized something new out of existing things that put the performance at level five yields something new. 
innovative and novel. And then level six in the original 1956 taxonomy is the ability to evaluate, compare, and judge. These uh, two levels, creation and evaluation, are not based on rules. They're based on uh, justification, relative comparisons, and because they don't use rules but use guidelines or other very abstract and high-level structures, they're much more complicated to teach and they're much more complicated to, to assess, but because they're not rule-based, they're also much more complicated to do. So the point for us is that Bloom's taxonomy increases and accumulates complexity. So these are hierarchical. The lesson for short, sharp, as well as long form teaching to be derived from Bloom's taxonomy is that if you want to develop the ability to evaluate for learners, if they need to look at a group of resources or look at a group of ideas or look at a, a pair of papers and evaluate them relative to one another, not using rules, you must first develop these earlier stage skills and lead the learner towards the ability to evaluate. Simply telling them papers with three authors are good and papers with four authors are better, then they would be doing rule-based discrimination or judgment. But if you want them to apply guidelines and not rules, you need to actually grow this hierarchy around what it is you're trying to teach. So for example, if you're training, uh, you may recognize any of these B1 through B4. You teach people, here's some code or whatever, and then you provide them the code. Then they are tasked with running the code or create code that does the following. The problem that they're solving in class with you is highly constrained and rule-based. Then, if that is the limit of the training that you're doing with them, they won't be able to apply whatever they've just learned at Bloom's level five to create new things, which is what scientists do pretty much for a living. And they certainly won't be able to evaluate the wellness, the goodness of an argument um, at Bloom's level six because they've only learned Java or whatever the code is or whatever the how to use the resource at Bloom's level one. So it's the same for Bloom's levels one, two, three, and four. If what you need is for a person to deploy the tool or resource or method in a novel problem that they've developed, you must train them up from one to five so that creativity is the end, not memorization, synthesis, understanding, or prediction is the end. So the lessons from these explicit uh, representations of what Blooms, what Blooms level are you teaching to and how are you assessing in your classroom? If your training does not go to or beyond the fourth level prediction, then the people who complete your training will not necessarily be able to move on to Blooms 5 and use that new information in their actual, uh, that won't be integrated into their habits of mind, what they normally do. If the training that you develop or that you deliver doesn't encourage the, the idea that we're going to Bloom's level four because that's all we have time for today, but you are going to need to create with this knowledge or you're gonna to need to use this to evaluate um, examples. Um, if the training doesn't encourage or lead to or prepare learners for working with that knowledge at Bloom's levels five and six, your training cannot be utilized by that learner to advance the field because advancing the field involves synthesis creativity and the evaluation of the literature to identify the need for that innovation. So Bloom's Levels 5 and 6 is where, that is where science happens. And if your training doesn't lead to or acknowledge that fact of human learning and thinking, uh, the training that you do will not lead to those sorts of innovations. Also, importantly is if you can look at this list on this slide of uh, what it looks like to do Bloom's Levels 1, 2, 3, or 4 in your training. If they can describe, if you can describe what you do in your class using words like this, you can specify what the prerequisites uh, for your course or program will be. So you can say, people, uh, for this workshop, you need to be able to implement rules using Bloom's taxonomy. 
in this workshop, you will learn to go from implementing a role in Bloom's taxonomy to synthesizing new and um, assignments using Bloom's taxonomy at Bloom's level five. Because I would have thought about Bloom's one, two, three, and four, I would be able to say, you have to be at this level to come into the class and benefit from it. But when you leave, you will be able to do this next level functioning. So it's it's very handy, uh, Bloom's is. Um, and you may have heard of Bloom's taxonomy, but you probably, unless you've talked to me about it before, have not heard about Sam Messick, who was a very famous psychometrician uh, focused on valid assessment for pretty much elementary school, uh, kids ages five through, I'm gonna say 13, um, or kindergarten through eighth or ninth grade. So the Messick criteria were um, articulated specifically to support valid decision-making based on tests. There, since testing and assessment is such an important part of how we develop, uh, how we develop curricula or courses, we decide I want a person to be able to do this, so I need to be able to assess whether they can, so that's how I'm gonna teach. Um, we can use the three critical questions that Messick laid out in 1994 to design our instruction, to evaluate whether or not it is or has the chance to um, achieve what we want it to, and to make changes to what we do so that what we teach will lead to the sorts of educational uh, or performance outcomes that we want. So the three criteria that Messick Messick laid out for valid decision making are first, you have to have identified the knowledge, skills, and abilities that whatever you're teaching is going to lead to. It's really important to consider what exactly, not generally, your teaching should lead to. Um, then you need to think abstractly, what would students need to do in order to show me that, that my goal number one, the knowledge, skills, and abilities I intended to deliver have been received? What is it that they have to do in order to show that? And then the way you design your assessment is what tasks can I design or find you know, on the internet that will elicit those specific behaviors from number two? So if it's a multiple choice exam, if your answer to number three is do well on a multiple choice exam, that has specific implications about what you intended in uh, question one and question two. I challenge anyone in higher education to choose multiple choice exams for the answer to number three in MESIC and go back to one and two in these MESIC questions and say, yes, multiple choice exam performance is exactly what I wanted students to be able to uh, do well on at the end of this uh, learning experience. That's uh, quite absurd, but it's very common. So it's important to think about the MESIC three when you think about your own existing instruction, or if you want to evaluate it, to improve it, or to uh, create it de novo. So the lessons from MESS ex explicitly are your teaching objectives, which lead you to answer questions like, what should I cover, should instead be learning objectives. What knowledge, skills, and abilities should this teaching lead to? That's a learning objective, not a teaching objective. If you know what the KSAs are, then you can choose from all the uh, material to cover as long as it will lead students to develop the, the KSAs that you've identified. So the second um, key lesson from the MESIC criteria are it, when you're doing an active learning or uh, in-class activities, those activities should provide practice at the KSAs, but also demonstrate for you, the learner, a check, you, the instructor, and for the learner. If you follow two and three here, these should demonstrate whether or not the students are getting the targeted KSAs. When you go back to the earlier example of here's some code, here's why the code is important, now run this code that I've given you, that does provide practice, but it doesn't demonstrate whether or not students did or did not get KSAs around programming, integrating this new knowledge into their daily uh, thinking or their new work. So it's really important to see how, where you are in Bloom's taxonomy in your classroom and what you want using these MESIC criteria can help you understand what you are doing and also what you're not doing. So these were absolutely developed, not 
uh, together in time. The Bloom's taxonometric um, effort was finished in 1956. So it was, I mean, Messick was around at that time, but he wasn't a psychometrician because psychometrics didn't really exist as a discipline at that time. It came around about 10 years later, but you can use these things together. So um, in terms of articulating your learning outcomes rather than your teaching outcomes, um, I have here a quote from the Stanford Education uh, School of Education um, learning outcomes are statements of the knowledge, skills, and abilities individual students should possess and can demonstrate upon completion of a learning experience or sequence of learning experiences. This is a really profound um, statement of the difference between a learning outcome and a teaching outcome. The teaching outcome is I need to get through chapters one and two this month or term or whatever. There, there is nothing there about what the student can do and that they can demonstrate what, what they've learned. Um, so it's really important to be able to change your perception from what I need to teach to what the students need to learn and how will I know that they've learned that, what can I get them to do to show they have or haven't learned that. Messick requires that the KSAs um, are articulated, but he also requires, as the Stanford definition um, specifies, that the student must be able to to show that the KSAs have been achieved. And then Bloom's taxonomy helps you understand where students need to start and where they could plausibly end so that you can do your MESIC, apply your MESIC three, meet the Stanford definition of learning outcome, but also be specific to the students who may be coming into your class. So you can use Bloom's and MESIC as you focus on your learning goals to plan your course or your short sharp session to make sure that the KSAs that are uh, of interest have learning opportunity, practice opportunity, and you will be able to give feedback. So I took the opportunity to think about what Messick might have said uh, regarding the Felden criteria. Now I identified the desired effects of short sharp training on early stage scholars, but the question is, how can students demonstrate that long-term retention and building on the training has achieved? That wasn't thought about when the federal, federally funded grants were proposing the short sharp training. It's really important to recognize that the effects of your training need to be uh, specified in terms of what can be assessed so that you can build your training and those things can be assessed. It's not just what the students demonstrate, but that your uh, training opportunity provides the opportunity for you to demonstrate whether or not the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you wanted to uh, in, uh, pass on had been taken up. So it's not just an evaluation of what the students are learning, but also an evaluation of how effective your training has been. Um, in the Felden paper, if you have a look, one of the items, I think, in some of the surveys, and this is common quite uh, right across the world, um, there are items on these surveys following short, sharp, or boot camp training, including things like, I would recommend this to others. We interpret the willingness of a student to recommend a course to others as endorsement, um, but it clearly doesn't demonstrate any impact. It, obviously wouldn't be a knowledge, skill, or ability that we would have wanted to build into the training. So it's a proxy, and it's not a very good proxy when you think about the MESIC criteria to determine whether or not your uh, learning, the learning experience was effective. Um, and then another challenge for the Felden, uh, the data the Felden group was evaluating. So they did not um, articulate the criteria, but across the United States when you propose training opportunities. One way the NIH National Institutes of Health itself chooses to determine whether or not they their educational initiatives have been effective is the people who completed them got a grant or had a publication involving um, the new knowledge. Now those are not aligned in any way with the specific KSAs. So not only are they proxies but they're much much further on proxies for the idea that the training was effective. If I go to training, and I have done in the past, and don't get what I needed out of it, but I do see, well, there's something there, I may be able to use it. 
I will leave that training and go out and try to learn about the thing myself. Then two years later, I will write a grant and maybe get one or write a paper and maybe have it published. Those events are clearly not the result of the training I experienced. And in fact, the training I experienced was an abject failure because I wasn't able to do get a grant or get a publication right out of that training. If your training is simply to set up people, the, uh, the objective of your training is to set them up so that they will go on to learn, that's really inefficient. You're getting people to come to your training, um, but you're not actually preparing them to do what you want them to be able to do. You're just setting it up so that maybe they will be more likely to do it. And in fact, the Feldman results show that you haven't actually done better than not going to the training. People who are gonna do it, learn it themselves, will do it and learn it themselves, and you're training has absolutely no impact on that. So those are two key lessons from educational sciences that are really concrete. I found them to be incredibly, almost magically, useful, especially when they're used together in evaluating my own uh, teaching and specifically planning how I'm going to evaluate the learning that people have done when they go to my workshops or my uh, courses or my programs. So now we're gonna quickly move to uh, look at lessons from cognitive science specifically looking at sustainability and the construct of metacognition. Now, sustainability is a type of attributes of learning, learning that continues beyond the edge of formal instruction. It's really important to understand that we, with when we're dealing with adults and particularly boot camps, they're finished with their formal training and they need to be able to, you need to be able to initiate learning that will then continue on. Um, that uh, acknowledgement is po possibly could be part of your MESIC criteria when you're looking through your own uh, materials. If you want learning to continue beyond the edge of the end of formal instruction, that has to be purpose built into your training. But understanding that sustainable learning is an objective will improve your teaching because it will promote um, ongoing learning, not just learning what happens in the classroom. There's a construct uh, called transfer, which has been very well studied in the United States, which relates to how if you're in a classroom and you learn how to run this code in the classroom, you may then apply it later in another context or in other situations um, that are not the same as where it was learned. That's really important for us as we do these short, sharp, and bootcamp type trainings because Obviously, what we do in class or in the training session is quite uh, artificial and constrained, and we want them to go off and then apply in their uh, if their creation and their synthesis or their evaluation and judgment. We want them to be transferring what they learn with us to those other contexts. Um, in general, short, sharp training has no lasting effect if learning can't continue to deepen. So if you have this boot camp type experience, it won't lead to sustainable learning if you can't uh, also include some sort of support for transfer. There is a construct that people say a lot, use it or lose it. Use it or lose it sort of means that I'm going to teach you something and if you don't practice, if you don't use that knowledge, you will lose that knowledge. That's really true, but in fact, when you're talking about uh, biologists or life scientists learning a completely different way of thinking about science, a more quantitative or more computational way of learning about science, the more accurate representation of use it or lose it is process it deeply or don't retain it and develop the KSA that whatever is the target at the Bloom's level where you need to deploy it or you'll never use it. So this uh, sustainable learning really does require, if you want to promote sustainable learning with your training and your uh, instructional design, you really need to think about Blooms and MESIC so that you will design an instructional experience where there's the opportunity for deep processing because that is required for retention. That's just how brains work. Um, but developing the KSA at the Blooms level where you need to use it is the key message here because if you develop it really well at Bloom's level one, but you need it at Bloom's level five, you will never use it. So the final or second lesson from cognitive science, because there are so many, cognitive science is just so great. Um, 
that you should think about it all the time, as I do, um, there is a construct metacognition, which is defined as the process of reflecting on and directing one's own thinking. Now, this uh, 2001 uh, book that was published by the National Research Council in the United States um, was almost entirely focused on kindergarten through high school uh, learning and assessing. But in fact, there's this fantastic book by Ambrose et al., uh, which I can't remember the name of, but it's I think it's in the resources, uh, the reference list of this uh, set of slides, so you'll be able to find it quite easily. Um, it's much more explicit. To become self-directed learners, students must learn to assess the demands of the task, evaluate their own knowledge and skills, plan their approach, monitor their progress, and adjust their strategies as needed. So the National Research Research Council goes on to say that metacognition is critical to any learning process and it is crucial to effective thinking and competent performance. We want, uh, when we have these short, sharp training and boot camp opportunities, students self direct towards them or they are directed to these opportunities by their advisors and mentors. But the, the true self directed learner sees what, they, what they're doing, their biological research. They assess the demands of the task of adding bioinformatics or more quantitative or computational features. And they need to be able to evaluate their own knowledge and skills that they have, but think about planning an approach to learning those skills and monitor their progress and adjust their strategies. All of those things happen to the very people we want to attract to our boot camp and short, sharp training. It turns out that metacognition is, like most things, a learnable and improvable set of skills, but they can only be learned and improved if they're recognized, they can be de deployed to help develop new literacies and new competencies. That's transfer, and the self-directed learner is the sustainable learner. So metacognition is actually sort of the underpinning idea to have real self-directed learning and ongoing learning, sustainable learning, we need to have metacognition in our curricula. Now, there is a paradox that is set up by metacognition. It is actually the application of the three most complex Bloom's level thinking types to our own thinking. So if you think back to your own educational experiences, you may recognize that there was a lot of remember, understand, and apply, and maybe a little analyze, but very little creation, very little evaluation explicitly taught and practiced in your formal educational setting. In fact, for metacognition to develop, you have to be able to analyze and predict, create and synthesize and evaluate and judge in real time, looking at your own thinking. So not only are these three most complex Bloom's level thinking types not often taught or practiced explicitly, Applying them to your own thinking is never taught and practiced. Remembering, understanding, and applying or illustrating can't really be applied effectively to your own thinking. So this paradox needs to be recognized. That's why I'm telling you. But but the, the fact is metacognition is rare and hard to develop specifically because of this paradox. Complex blooms level thinking isn't taught and practiced. And even when it is taught and practiced, it's never directed at thinking. So that's education and cognitive science. The Carpentries is a global organization. They specialize in short, sharp training. I think their longest training session is two days. Uh, they are committed to training around um, using software, creating software, and using data and research. So for them, the um, this whole talk and all of these ideas were put together specifically by invitation. Uh, from the Carpentries, I wrote a white paper. It's been published on the SOCH Archives uh, preprint server, so you can get it there, um, articulating all of these points and more. But um, specifically, the Carpentries formulated a response um, acknowledging that space training and long-term training is the best, but it isn't always feasible. They uh, Carpentries, like everyone, recognizes there's a global gap in uh, the skills that are needed for bioinformatics. So short, sharp training needs to be offered. And because they understand how humans learn and think, they have two specific strategies that I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, right now. The first strategy is meet 
the learner where they are. And the second is explicitly explicitly address the motivation and self-efficacy that is typical of the adult uh, learner slash adult self-directed learner. So the strategy, the first strategy, meet learners where they are. There are questions that you need to answer for yourself if you want to adopt this strategy. When you say meet learners, it involves both you and both you and them. You're meeting someone. So they need to know where they are and you need to know where you are. That means you have to be explicit about the blooms level that's required for your training. Um, and you in the use in the uh, prerequisites for any sort of training session you can you can do this but you also need to think about preparing them to grow a level you want them to understand that where they are now isn't sufficient and the training isn't just designed to develop or to deliver knowledge but also to help them change from a lower level blooms uh, complexity to a higher level and you might want to embed sustainability into the design of the learning that you've um, offered because growing a level will take time and practice on the learner's part and you need to prepare them to engage in that practice and seek feedback when they're no longer in the classroom with you. So part of meeting learners where they are is you need to meet learners and specify where they are and prepare them to move on from there. It's also important to think, uh, to keep in mind that because of the Kruger-Dunning paradox and the general uh, problem that human beings have accurately reporting their own internal states, that where a person says they are may be exaggerated. So you need to be really explicit about what you can do and what uh, the training will do uh, with respect to the training. It's really much more important on the instructor's part, but being specific on the learner's part and also building in sustainability may engage the person suffering under the Kruger-Dunning um, misappreciation of their own abilities to recognize that where they need to go is actually quite far away from where they are now. And Specifying where you plan on meeting and leading the learners is the sort of second part of being explicit with your blooms, using your MESIC criteria, promoting metacognition and sustainability in all the educational opportunities that you design, evaluate, deliver, and, um, and then assess. You can use the uh, MESIC criteria explicitly to specify where you plan on meeting students so that you do in fact meet them where they they are and help them develop a plan to get away, get further past where you've met them. Um, again, keeping in mind that because of Dunning Kruger, learners, learners don't usually know where they are. And most, I would say, most of the people who contributed data to the Felden at all, uh, most of the postdoctoral, predoctoral, and doctoral level learners who contributed data, they don't know where they are, but they don't really understand how hard it is to get to where they need to go. So you need to characterize that finished with this course isn't actually the end of learning. The second carpentry strategy uh, explicitly address motivation and self-efficacy is easily addressable when you know, it's easily doable when you use Blooms and Messick specifically to describe both what you expect what you expect from the learner when they come in, what you expect the learner to be able to do when they leave, and what you will provide in order to get them from the start to the finish during the time frame you've articulated for your course. Um, you want to be able to describe the performance level that they're expected to um, achieve in your short, sharp training or beyond where they need to go and give them some idea of what beyond will look like and motivate them to get there. So you have motivation and self-efficacy in the self-directed learner. That's why they come to your workshops anyway, either when they decide to come rather than are told to come by their mentors. So you do have some motivation already, but you need to describe what more looks like. What does beyond uh, the end of this workshop look like so that they can be motivated to continue and experience sustained and sustainable learning. You want to motivate um, 
sustainable learning and encourage them in explicitly, not just telling them use it or lose it, which actually I have been told in some boot camps that I've been to for software, uh, statistical software, use it or lose it, you spend eight hours in this R class and so please go out and use it. But if they didn't prepare me, like none of them has, to actually utilize R in my creative and synthetic and evaluative work, I don't use it. Um, but that isn't why I lose it. Oh, and that's the end. So uh, these are the most or some of the resources that I uh, mentioned. And in the uh, manuscript, the Carpentries, Carpentries manuscript that's on the Soak, Soak archives, uh, it does not appear to be listed here, but I can send you that, um, that link to that URL uh, when you need to when you need it, anybody who emails. Right. Um, thank okay. you, that was fantastic. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to, you know, on, on, on all of these issues. So it's it's fantastic to hear about this in the context, I think, in the framework that you've provided. Um, we don't have any questions in the question pod yet. So if all the listeners want to have a think and type any questions in there, I will relay them to um, Rochelle. But I guess I was, while, while the audience is doing that, I. I guess you sort of touched on it at the end. I was interested in this whole, you know, in the designing a program, I guess, for graduate students is could be mm -hmm. in some sense easy because as the provider of the training, you can provide that structure to ensure that, you know, there are, there are modules and levels mm -hmm. that people can progress through. Um, often, certainly with the types of researchers mm -hmm. we're dealing with, who are time poor, they have a day job, they, you know, I guess yeah. do ad hoc training. Um, it seems to me that as a, as a provider of training, we have a real responsibility to almost help them map or m map their journey yes. and, and understand yes. where they are. So I was just wondering if you think yeah. that we almost, we, we should all have a responsibility to do this all the time. Yes. Um, okay. So short answer. Yes, you're right. Um, and one of the sort of the carpentry's ideas um, is that yes, learning more formal programs, it's it's easier or it's more um, amenable to implementing these sorts of things uh, to treat, teach people how to use bioinformatics, for example, but that just isn't feasible because most people are upskilling. Um, you don't want to have to start with a new generation that comes through a program to start uh, having bioinformatics enriched biology education, uh, biology uh, research, and people who've been biologists for some time are among the best prepared to take new technology and expand the reach of their questions or the sophistication of their answers. So I, I completely understand. And um, that's why I brought the Carpentries um, ideas here because they do do these shorter term um, uh, training modules. And their two strategies are actually really um, consistent with these because they have a huge cognitive psychological component in their overall design, all the Carpentries training um, does. The I think the um, lesson for short form training or the lessons for short form training are not different than the lessons for long form training. You just need to be explicit about every single thing you do. So for example, or as an aside, I guess, I see a lot of what I call a rush to scale, that if you're going to teach, if you're going to have training, it needs to reach the max number of people. So we're going to design it so it's scalable. And that's the starting point is to design for scalability of training. And my recommendation is not to do that anymore. Don't rush to scale, rush to excellence and look at what would it take to make sure no one leaves this program or this two hour session or whatever without a spectacularly clear idea of what how to do this and to be motivated and energized to do it this way and continue on. Then look at how to scale that. What can you do in two hours for people who are harried or some are mouse biologists and some are cellular biologists, look at the crazy, no one's gonna be able to do that level and then try to scale that up. And if you do it that way, instead of looking at scalability first, 
There will be challenges, but you can use Messick and Blooms to solve those challenges. If you've rushed to scale, it's very difficult to retrofit. And I'll give you two really good examples. There's a training coordinating center in the United States that was funded by the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. They rushed to map, and I use the term loosely, 10,000 learning opportunities which included videos, uh, videoed webinars or keynote speech, speeches or whatever. So yes, with technology, you can make those 10,000 learning opportunities available, findable, searchable, but there's no way that's going to lead. None of that can lead to effective learning mm. uh, by anyone. It mm. definitely can lead to watching the videos. Um, and um, there's another, uh, so there's another in the Elixir, um, sort of the par parallel. In the Elixir model, you have individual countries with their spectacular resources and their analytic methods um, creating little training opportunities. And then they want to retrofit uh, models like this. What are the Bloom's levels? What are the other um, sort of features so that people can choose where they are and make a plan? That'll never work because the people who develop the workshops don't weren't thinking about blooms when they when they started out. So so these retrofitting um, initiatives are are hugely problematic. And the result is, oh, cognitive science isn't really that important. But having a lot of resources available so people can search for themselves does definitely value the user experience. But because Kruger Dunning is so profoundly effective at limiting people's abilities to sort of see what they really need. Yes, you need to do it in a short amount of time. That's a given. But you also really need an effective learning experience, which people don't really, it's, it's very hard for people to choose. So that, that is one reason why impact of these large scale training uh, portals has been so weak. It, the impact has been so limited. And this short, sharp, uh, the Felden results are just one example, a right. concrete empirical example of why a rush to scalability rather than a rush to excellence with scalability following that that is not going to help uh, solve this problem this skills gap yep um great okay thank you um we've now got a few questions in here so i'll we've got about eight minutes left so let's try and crack through as many of these as possible so okay um rochelle thanks for a great talk right. uh, with your training do you survey attendees directly after they finish the training and if you do, can you give some examples of the types of questions you ask? Uh, I don't do training per se because I'm a regular university instructor. I give assessments midway through and at the end. And at, to date, um, the last time I did that was 2012. Um, and what I was looking for was input on what did the students think I could do to make the course better for them? Did they think the book was the material too fast? Did I ask too many questions? Were they responsible for too much reading and things like that? So I asked them directly about their personal experience about it. And I tried to make sure that the questions would have as little Kruger Dunning as possible. Um, then I just actually published a paper with these results in it about sustainable learning where between three months and two years after a course was finished, I asked students specifically, sustainable learning is defined by this, number one, two, three, and four. Can you recognize in your own work whether or not one, two, three, or four has ever happened? Did it happen? Do you think it happened as a result of this class? And can you give a brief narrative of how you did that thing, whatever it was? So there were nine respondents, so I was able to sort through. I had It was a, a, a research project, so I had an anthropologist, a qualitative researcher, code all the students' narrative responses. And what we found was nine out of nine students recognized all the features of sustainability in their own lives. They were in the class, and then later they said, I transferred the knowledge I got in the ethics course to my actual work with other people. So those four questions are actually published in this paper, which I'm happy to send you. Um, and, and you can do it, but you really have to think this through. Again, I didn't use a multiple choice survey. It was a very detailed survey. The students, um, all nine of them responded, but this was, they didn't send the data to me. 
they sent it to the um, coder. They weren't in my program. There was absolutely no reason for them to respond except to share sort of their ongoing journey of learning. Um, so, so I have those examples, but again, that's not a rush to scalability. And in fact, that survey would be quite uh, burdensome if, if you, the interpreter of the survey results, had more than you know 10 um, or 12. But you, you absolutely can use features of sustainability and ask questions. Did this happen to you? Can you think of one or more examples of this happening to you? And then optional, tell me what, what that was so you can get an idea of what are people saying. So you can scale it in that way. Okay, um, so time for one more question. So um, this one says, as someone who has struggled to gain statistical and bioinformatics skills, I've sought out many short courses. Does this mean that there is really no shortcut to learning and I just have to find the extensive time to <laughs> find everything skills on my own data sets and projects? And it's typically uh, called lifelong learning and self-directed learning, I think. Right, right. I think that um, the second option that you've chosen will be very challenging for you. So I don't recommend that because you'll continually be, continually be frustrated by the um, lack of MESIC, lack of Bloom's awareness in the resources that you do find, even if they're long term. So this is someone who's gone through many semester long courses in statistics and methods and experimental design. All of the things I'm telling you now, I synthesized myself. They didn't come to me from cognitive science or from um, educational psychology, in fact. Um, but the uh, idea, what you need is to see a map of what it looks like to be statistically literate or statistically functional. I just published a statistical literacy uh, map. It's called a mastery rubric. It was published in 2017, so I can send you that. Um, and um, and so so what you do need you need a map, and and they don't exist. So the mastery rubric is a construct that I created specifically to map out a curriculum and to help self-directed learners. Um, I wrote a grant to get a to write a book about how to be self-directed about your um, learning statistics, but it wasn't funded. So, uh, but anyway, so yes, the problem that you're experiencing is very common, but trying to sort it out on your own will be very very difficult. So. Oh. Yeah. Yay, if you want to commit to that, but um, but it will be frustrating. I mean, I'll just warn you ahead of time, you should totally do it, but it'll be really frustrating. It sounds like all providers, you know, at national levels and institutional levels and state levels definitely have that responsibility to help provide that map, I would say. Yeah. Um, and one... one yeah, but it's very difficult. Um, I'm, oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say yeah. one last quick question. Um, do you think okay. the covering material at just a B1 level is adequate or useful um, if it's explained that this is no. simply an no. introductory workshop? No. No. I think that, that if you have B1 level material, you should send that out ahead of time and say, these are the vocabulary words you need to know maybe a little concept map of how they're related, why I'm telling you these things, but you need to remember what these words are and then come in ready to understand deeper relationships or move forward from there. There's absolutely no reason to give a vocabulary lesson to a person unless you're teaching them. It is a foreign language, but you need to understand these. some of these are verbs, they have to be conjugated. Some of these are nouns, they have to have the correct gender ending or the um, declension. You can't just give a vocabulary list and expect a person to be able to have a conversation. So I don't think there's any reason for that. But, but when a person does have basics of declensions or uh, conjugation or other language features, then sending out updated vocabulary lists can be helpful. But it's not a good way to initiate a person into thinking this way. Mm -hmm. the way you want them to with, with those words. That won't happen. I mean, it's like almost physically impossible for that to to happen. Right. All right. And by physically impossible, I mean that's not how brains work. Yes. Okay. No, fantastic. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much for this. This has been a really fantastic webinar, I think. And I think a lot of a lot of the people I certainly, you know, we're researchers first and somehow trainers second. So I think to yes. be more aware of this right. yep. fantastic um, to hear about all of this. Um, so Great. I going to now also thank thank you for doing this and uh, enjoy the rest of your stay in Australia Rochelle's actually sitting in Melbourne at the thank moment. you um, what I will do is just um, 
say that um, so and thanks everyone to who attended for attending this webinar as well. So um, yes, thank you all very much. So if people have um, other ideas for future webinars, uh, we have an email address, webinars at mblabr.org.au. So please um, email us if you know of any uh, topics you'd like to hear about. Um, you should check out our webinars page on the website. So it's mblabr.org.au slash webinars. Um, our next two webinars are going to be in October on two consecutive days. Uh, and they'll be delivered by Bob Kuhn from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and he's the Associate Director of the UCSC Genome Browser. Um, the first uh, webinar, it, it'll go longer than this one. It's going to go for an hour and a half. Um, it'll be about uh, how to use the browser, and the second one will be about data that can be accessed through the browser. Um, so thanks, everyone, uh, again, for uh, attending. As I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be uh, this has been recorded, and we'll make a um, this available through the Emble AVR website and also through the Emble AVR YouTube channel. We'll email all of you when that is available. It'll be next week. Um, finally, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge some funders. So Emble AVR would like to acknowledge funding from Bioplatforms Australia and the University of Melbourne, and AIDC. I would like to acknowledge funding from NCRIS. Um, so as the webinar closes, there's going to be a short survey, so please fill it out. Um, it helps us to design uh, these uh, um, webinar program. Um, your feedback's really important to us, so it'll only take a minute, so if you could please fill it in, that would be fantastic. Um, please do, it's super important. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks to Rochelle again, and thanks to all of our attendees. and. Um, we look forward to seeing you in October at the next webinar. Thanks. Goodbye.